Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for who you are and what you've done for us. And Father, I just ask that tonight that someone gets something out of this and that it is all you. That it is the work that you have done, not only in my life, but their life and the people I'm going to talk about tonight. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Um, this was not on the agenda, and probably about three quarters of the way through, uh, Barry and I decided that this might not be a bad idea to let people know who I am, where I've been, and why I'm here. Okay, so um, I tonight, a uh, couple of things I'm going to say. One is, no names will be used. Case histories will be exactly like uh, they were in the time, but no names. My family's names will not be used. My past family's names and my current family's names. And as I go through this, you'll understand why. First of all, uh, my family that I grew up in, I grew up in a little town in Ashland, Kentucky. Well, in Kentucky, it's Ashland, Kentucky. And <clears throat> but, uh, I think the population was about 25,000, if you included the hitherlands out there. Um, it was a great time. It was a leave it to beaver time. Some of you can identify with that. Uh, my family, they were good people. They're wonderful people. They were hardworking, honest people, good country people. No better people than the good country people. Um, my father was uh, Scott Irish, full-blooded Scott Irish, and I preface this because it'll make sense later. My mother was uh, Cherokee Indian. Her family um, was on the Dawes Rolls, and they were considered from the Chickamauga tribe. Um, they were awarded 200 acres for uh, reparation, and <clears throat> they farmed that 200 acres in uh, the Cumberland Mountains, the foothills of the Cumberland Mountains in Kentucky. I spent lots of summers there, didn't like it, but I'd love to go back now. So it was um, uh, a good time growing up. Um, again, my, my father's family were staunch, orthodox, Scot-Irish Catholic, my mother, I don't know. God was never mentioned in the home. Um, I had three brothers, two older, uh, one that was adopted that was two years younger. When I came along, my youngest full brother was 16 years old. So a couple of years after I was born, I understand he went into the army and he was in the Korean War. He ended up being um, missing in action and a POW. After the war was over, he came back, and he came back not well. So as I look back, I, I didn't know then, but as I look back now, he probably was bipolar. That's what many, many years ago, someone diagnosed him as bipolar one, and it probably the gene lay dormant until he was involved in the the war and then it came out of dormancy and uh, the PTSD was horrendous. He was way different. They spent a lot of time and energy on him and I look back now and I understand that. So I sort of had to fend for myself, but I had a wonderful social group. Uh, some of the friends I still have today, we meet one or two times a year. They're coming in March. I hope I get them in this church. Some of them are believers and some are not, but I'd love to see them before our pastor. Um, it was a wonderful social group. We were in the three of us were in the nursery together. And then we went to grade school, then we went to junior high, and then we went to high school. So it was that group, that close knit group, um, that gave me security and wonderful socialization. It was an era where we didn't have internet. We had three TV channels, black and white, CBS, NBC, ABC. And you had to get up and turn the dial. I don't know if some of you remember that, and that just says, I remember it, which I hate to admit, but I do. So it was um, 
um, a time right in my high school years when the Vietnam War had, had broken out and several of our friends were drafted in, in, and a lot of them had to go to war and my younger brother that was adopted had to go to Vietnam. So I had three brothers that had been in, in, in war and my oldest, oldest brother had been in the Navy in World War II. So yes, I was born into an older family. They were not expecting me. And um, thank God abortion wasn't legal then or I might not be here today. So it was, um, and not because they didn't want me. I think I've, I, as I've said in here before, they were tired. <laughs> they thought they were done. Um, we went off to college. Uh, most of my friends and I went off our first year. We, uh, after the first year, we uh, hooked back up in Ashland in June. Uh, we had all just finished that first year and we were gonna have a party and a reunion and we did. And uh, before I left to go to the party, my father said, now don't forget, in the morning we're gonna go horseback riding. And I think that was twofold, to get me out in the morning and for me not to party too much. Well, I did. Um, I, had, I had started drinking earlier, like about 15 or 16, but not much. And my father's side of the family, my aunt gave me a bottle of wine for my 16th birthday. And I look back now, and who does that, you know? <laughs> so only a group that, it, you know, the drinking was not a problem. And again, I don't have, you know, alcohol's legal. But if you, if you don't have a problem with it, but if you've got a problem with it, it's lethal. So um, went out that night, partied with my friends, drank a lot, a lot. Came in, I guess it was we er we early hours of the morning, and I couldn't beg off on the riding. I had to go do that. I didn't. I like to ride. I rode horses all my life. I love horses. So we left early to go out to <clears throat> my father's friend's farm, and he was um, his farm trained horse horses, horse racing horses. Kentucky is a state of tobacco, whiskey, and horses. That's why it's a poor state, you know. So it, um, it was his farm. So as we got there, it was early. I was still, I'm sure, um, I know I was. I was definitely compromised. And so when we got there, uh, the man that owned the farm, and I know him well, he's passed since now, but I, for the sake of his family, I'm just not gonna mention his name. Um, He's the horse I usually would ride. He said, you know what? Why don't you try Kentucky Pride? He said, she's it's a young one. She's fast. I love that. So I went out to saddle uh, Kentucky Pride up. And evidently in my, my stupor, I didn't tighten the saddle tight enough. And as I was around the timing track, that's where you just warm the horse up and yeah, I was getting the horse used to me, and I was getting used to the horse. So about I, I about halfway around, I guess, I don't remember. Uh, I've blocked a lot of that, and I'll explain that later. It's a lot of the stuff we've been studying about. I um, started, I was sideways in the saddle, so I thought, well, uh, the best I can remember, throw my leg over and get off. Well, my foot got hooked up in the, in the, um, in the saddle and um, in a stirrup, and I don't remember anything after that. So as the story goes, the horse took me around uh, that timing track many times, and they were trying to stop the horse, and I ended up waking up in St. Joe's Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. I'd had an eight-hour surgery. I uh, had a broken back. Um, the back was broken. Um, uh, about an eighth of an inch, the doc said, from my spinal cord. So he couldn't move it. So he had to fuse it into a block of bone. So they took a, my pe right pelvis bone out, pelvic bone out, and fused it into my back. It was a nightmare. Um, back then, I was in the hospital, I think, about three weeks. Um, and then um, my parents you know, took me home and 
in the back of the car my father had put like a board and some, uh, some padding so that I could lie down straight. I was given morphine, um, I am intermuscular every, I, I don't know, I guess every eight hours is what it was. I don't remember, of course, but it was for three weeks. So rightfully so, I left there with an addiction, an addiction to opioids. And I had as much uh, Percodan, Valium, and whatever else that I needed. And I took, I, I got that when I got home and I stayed on it, okay? The recovery was a tough recovery. It was, it was probably um, the whole recovery, learning how to walk again and have physical therapy was probably a year. In the meantime, um, I did what anyone in pain or emotional pain or what have you, I had um, been sidelined out of school for that length of time. Um, um, I did them pills and I drank heavily. It wasn't a little bit, it was heavily. So this went on for a number of years and I was then able to take, cut down on the pills so the alcohol stayed, the alcohol never left. And at that time, um, after a couple of years of, of um, you know, recovering, um, my husband and I at the time went to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And um, we were in Chattanooga. We just had moved into Chattanooga and my uh, father-in-law and mother-in-law came to visit us. And, and um, <clears throat> one of his wishes was that we would go to church. They were Christians. He, m my husband was raised in a Christian home. My, those two were uh, very devout Christians. And I always envied that. Um, and they witnessed to me, but I didn't, um, um, didn't accept Jesus until we got to Chattanooga. When we got to Chattanooga, he said, I would like for you to go to church. That's my wish. So we did, uh, the four of us, my, my in-laws and my husband and I went to Brainerd Baptist in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And as we were standing there, uh, when the service was over, um, there was a couple behind us and two couples, and they tapped us on the shoulder and introduced themselves. And they said, you're new? And I said, yeah. And um, <clears throat> I got to know um, those, those folks behind us really well. And she said, one of them said, well, I teach Sunday school and we're having a party at my house on Friday night. Would you come? And I was getting ready to say, well, you know, I don't think so. And then the woman over on her her, her right said, my, um, we'll come and pick you up. So I thought, well, you know, they're nice. I'm going to go. So I get up there, and we're at the party, and I was, you know, sidelined by a couple of people. And what brought you to Chattanooga? And I said, business. And what brought you to Brainerd? And I said, business. I said, I'm in church because of business. I said, this is the buckle of the Bible belt. Nobody is going to do a good business here without being in church. I was honest. I was unchurched. I didn't know what to say. So I didn't know how to make anything up. I didn't know how to fake it or anything. I still don't, really, okay? So we, um, we went to church there, and I love the Sunday school teacher. Uh, we're friends today. She's about uh, 10 or 12 years older than I, and she is just a precious dear friend. So as time went on, um, the people that we uh, were in business with were in Lexington, Kentucky. So they would fly down uh, sometimes on a Friday and Saturday night, and we would go party with them. Well, party to me meant, you know, you party and you drink, you know. And uh, so we did a lot. And... Um, I remember just coming in and, you know, sometimes not going to bed, just going, getting dressed and going to Sunday school and church. So one Monday morning, um, the church ladies came to visit me. <laughs> and uh, there, I think uh, there was three of them. And uh, one was the Sunday school teacher and two other ladies. And so the spokesperson 
uh, had been, I guess, in, in the church since the beginning of the church. And she, she was the one that said, <clears throat> well, we've had several people tell us that in Sunday school they smell alcohol on you. I said, yeah. I said, I go out and party. We go out and party with our friends from Lexington on Saturday night, and I just come on in to Sunday school and church. And I said, I tell you what. Um, <laughs> I said, I tell you what. Um, when we go out on Saturday night to party with them, guess what? I just won't come to church. <laughs> I didn't say I'd quit drinking. I just said I won't come to church. So as time went on, the Sunday school teacher would come and visit me during the week. And um, one, one afternoon, she sat down with me. And she, they, you remember the spiritual laws? Does anybody remember spiritual laws, the little pamphlet years ago? Okay, maybe not. But anyway, there was a, there were, okay, thank you. I thought I wasn't dreaming that. I remembered it. Um, um, so she brought the little pamphlet, Spiritual Laws. And we went through it. And she looked at me, because I read it all. But I just read it. It wasn't a heartfelt. I just read it. And I said, I, I said, that's really nice or something. I don't remember exactly what I said. But after that, I kept going. And I heard the word. I heard the word at Brainerd. I heard the word both from the Sunday school uh, teacher and from the pastor. And I was surrounded with Christians. I didn't know any non-Christians. And so went to a Tuesday morning Bible study. Uh, really got some wonderful teaching there. And so one day, I, and, and I was walking down the hallway of the home we were in. And I just stopped, and I put my head up against the wall in the hallway. And I said, I don't know you, Lord Jesus, but I want to know you. <clears throat> Will you come into my life and make my life the kind of life you want it to be? And no bells and whistles went off or anything like that. But I know from as the days went on, the weeks went on, the months went on, that I was truly saved. And so I went to the pastor and I told him what I had, what had happened. And I, I said, I want to be baptized. So I was baptized at Brainerd Baptist in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And after that, did I quit drinking? No. And I, I prefaced my father coming from Scott Irish, uh, Orthodox Catholic background, and my mother from, as a Cherokee Native American. The two genes that carry the gene for alcoholism, the Irish and the Native Americans. So I'm, I'm sure I'm loaded there. Um, my friend, the geneticist, said it's on chromosome 4P. Um, and there are genes, various genes, packed into that chromosome. So. Um, I believe that I don't believe I know because the first drink that I took, I couldn't get enough. I wanted more. I could have bathed in it. I loved it. And I hate to admit that, but I, I did. And that had to be some sort of genetic predisposition. Since then, um, we did some, um, um, I don't want to get ahead of myself, some what we call rat running research. Um, with white rats and injected their brains with, I think it's called tetrahydra, tetrahydra, THC, anyway. <laughs> I, don't get, I don't remember the last part of tetrahydroquinoline, tetrahydroquinoline, I believe. So we injected the brains with, with that and uh, the rat, and I'll talk about this in the addictions part, but anyway, the white mice couldn't get enough alcohol once we introduced them to the alcohol. So there is that research that has gone on that's pretty much been proven. I, I got ahead of myself there. But the, the thing is, is that the drinking really never did quit. So I ended up back in my hometown, very sick, very sick, very addicted to alcohol, and went to see 
a friend of mine that I had uh, gone all the way through school with, and he was a physician now in our hometown. And I went to see him, and I said, um, I said, I'm sick. I, 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 I'm just really sick, and I don't know what's wrong with me. And I said, I'm, I'm nauseous. I'm throwing up. I'm, I'm, I have pain in my stomach. And he said, well, let me pull some blood work. So he did. And he pulled the blood work, called me up at home, and he said, can you come back in right away? And I said, yeah, I can. So I went in to see him, and he said, um, you have pancreatitis, and your liver enzymes are through the roof. And I said, well, how did I get that? And he said, by drinking. He said, and you're drinking now. And that's the big denial right there. And, and that's also the cover-up. You don't want anyone to ever know how much you're drinking. And you're drinking a lot. I mean, when you're waking up at 2 and 4 and doing what I used to call the two-hour feeding, I would get up at 2 and 4 and drink and go back to sleep because I couldn't sleep. The blood level was dropping, so guess what? I needed to drink. So he sent me to Huntington, St. Mary's at Huntington, West Virginia. They had just opened up the fourth and fifth floor, which was the fourth. I said to the missions person, I said, you're not locking me up. I'm not coming if you're going to lock me up. And she said, no, you can go to the fifth floor. That's, you can leave any time you want. That's the one where we have um, the drug and alcohol unit. The bottom floor is the psychiatric unit. So I ended up on the fifth floor, and um, he was a good man. My friend said, this is a good man, and he was very, very, um, you know, sensitive and compassionate and what have you. And his brother was the therapist that worked with him, so they worked as a team. And so he was detoxing me. Well, the, uh, the admission process is where you're supposed to be really honest about what you're doing. And... Um, uh, I don't know any act and alcoholic that is honest. I'm not kidding. Uh, you ask them if they went down on the left side of the street, and they really did. They're going to tell you the right side. That's just the way it works. Um, so I wasn't completely truthful about what I was drinking and or the volume I was taking or a Perkindan from time to time. So um, I told the admissions person, I said, you know what, I just want to get rid of the pills totally and just drink a little bit. And she said, mm-hmm. So I'm sure that wasn't the first time she had heard that. So I was admitted, got, got um, into my room. About the second day, I guess it was, maybe third, I don't remember, but I started into DTs. And I had what they call formication, where you've got like ants under your skin. So I went down to the nurse's station and I said, look, I want a volume and I want a drink and I want it right now. <laughs> she said, well, you can't have that. You can have Finnegan and Ativan. I said, I want a drink. I am gonna rip this nurse's station apart if you don't give me a drink. So two big guys came by and hauled me back to bed and she came through the door with her purse lips and <laughs> the needle up in the air and that's all I remember. And the next morning my doc came in and he said, I understand you're going to tear my nurse's station apart last night. And I said, no, no threat. No. And really, they were not in any danger, I'll guarantee you. I just thought that it would get me something that I needed at that time. So I said, look, he said, you ready to be honest? I said, I am. I said, this is, this is what I was doing. So I was there quite a while. Um, and as you're there for a while, you're able to... Um, go out for dinner and a movie. My husband came and got me and took me to dinner and a movie. And we went to see Norma Ray. Okay, I don't know if any of you remember that, but that's Sally Field played Norma Ray. That's a um, pretty true story. It's about the beginning of the unionization of the thread mills in North and South Carolina. And she was an advocate for them. And she really, you know, it cost her a lot. But that, that you know, and she was standing up on some platform advocating and, uh, um, as proposing the union. So I remember uh, praying and, and to God and saying, if you'll get me over this, I promise you I will work with the folks that have been where I've been. And I remember that as clearly as if it had been yesterday. So... 
I left there and I didn't touch another drink. I have not had a drink or any kind of benzodiazepine, which is Valium, Ativan, opioid. Um, I had to have surgery, but I told the doc before that, and I, I got something like, I don't know, a very smidgen amount to go home with. And <clears throat> so I have not touched anything. My life is so boring, so boring, except I have Jesus, and he's not boring. Thank you. Thank you. So when I got out, um, I, I was really shaky and fragile, very fragile. And I knew that I had to do everything I could to not take that drink. Everything. I mean, I had to really, you know, move forward and keep my days occupied. And my days were occupied. I volunteered at a Christian halfway house, and it's called Sunlight Center, S-O-N-L-I-G-H-T Center, in my little hometown. And we were a holding place for the Vietnam vets who came back from the war with horrendous opioid problems, horrendous alcohol problems, horrendous PTSD. So the VA from Huntington, West Virginia would bring them down in the VA car and we would hold them. Sometimes they would be there for maybe three, four days or a week, maybe, maybe a month until they could go on to um, Cincinnati, which was a long-term treatment, or Lexington, Kentucky, which was long-term treatment for those, um, those vets that were addicted. So I worked there until we were able to go, had a transfer to Texas. Ended up in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. And I didn't know anyone. It was scary. I was probably about, only about a year and a half, two years into recovery. And I did go to AA there. Um, but I wasn't strong enough to do anything more than that, like sponsor anyone or anything. So I went to the local uh, Jewish Federation in Fort Worth because I love Israel. I do. I absolutely adore Israel and the Jews. I love the Jewish population. So I went to the Federation and I, I walked in the door and here's this Gentile walking in and saying, do you have any envelopes I can stuff or do some volunteering? And of course, I don't know if I was the first to do that, but they sure looked like I was the first. And they did put me to work. They put me, they, they sent me over to Hadassah, which is the Women's Zionist Organization, which supports Hadassah Medical Center in, Hadassah Medical Center in, in Israel. So they, they sent me there, and I went to the first luncheon, and I, you know, I met some wonderful people at the luncheon. And I, um, I didn't really tell them why I was there. You know, I didn't say I'm a raging alcoholic and if I don't stay here, I'm gonna go out and drink. I didn't do that. I just said I love Israel, which was true, okay? So um, I worked their rummage sales. I worked their bake sales. I helped raise money for Hadassah. Uh, they put me on the board. I was the only Gentile on the board. Um, I got to speak at one of their um, regional, um, I guess you would call it conventions. It, um, it was a wonderful, wonderful time, and I really believe it was the gateway into the long-term recovery. Along the way, I met an elderly lady by the name of Sippa. That's all she has passed, long passed. Sippa was a, a shot in. Uh, she was the daughter of a New York rabbi, and um, a very, very smart woman in I guess in an unspoken way, she mentored me. She taught me a lot about Judaism, taught me a lot about the Torah. Um, she, uh, I witnessed to her. I told her about Jesus. I told all of them about Jesus. And you know what? They didn't kick me out. You would think they would have kicked me out of Hadassah. I'm a lifetime member of Hadassah. So, but they didn't. They loved me. They included me. Um, I got to go to Yom Kippur, which you have to have a ticket to get in there. I got to go there. I got to go to all the bar mitzvahs. It was as if I were Jewish, but I was, uh, I had a, um, my God definitely was Jesus Christ. Is my, what is it they say? Your big brother. 
He's my Jewish big brother. He's my God. That's what he is. But I told him about Jesus. And when it was, when Holy Spirit led, and it was usually in a time when Sippa and I were, she was lighting the menorah and we were, she was praying and I was praying. She was praying in Hebrew. I was praying to Yeshua, Jesus. So that, that went on and I did go back to school and I got everything that I needed to get to equip me to do what? To do what I told the Lord I would do in the Keith Albee that night. So in saying that, I, I was in several, worked in several of the psych hospitals in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, um, opened up uh, and started a lot of their outpatient programs. And I want you to know, this is Jesus, okay? This is not me, okay? This is, the, everything I'm getting ready to tell you is Jesus, not me. Um, one particular case history that I'll talk about uh, there were several, so you can times it a hundred of the people that, that crossed the path, okay, of Yeshua. You, you, can, you can times it, but this is one in particular. This guy was a referral from one of my attorney referrals, and he walks through the door, and he looks like he has stepped out of GQ, you know, dressed to the nines, good-looking guy, smart, and I thought, well, What's, what's his problem? And the attorney, you know, doesn't tell me. He just says, I got this guy I want you to see. He's in a little bit of trouble. He'll tell you all about it, period. Okay. So he comes to the door, and I, you know, meet with him, do an assessment. And he is um, very successful. He, he, he was a very successful person in Dallas. And I say that because what I'm about to tell you, you'd say, well, how can somebody that successful... Uh, and his wife was very successful. Both. This is couple. This was a. I would say. I'm gonna, this is my term. A power couple. So he walks to the door. He sits down. He tells me everything. He has to be there, though. He doesn't want to be there. It's kind of obvious. He doesn't want to be there. So he has to be there. And his story is this. And I'm not. La I'm just laughing at his attitude. He was arrogant. And I, I guess uh, cocky is arrogant. He was all of that. And he said, all I did was, and I'm thinking, okay. So he was in, he was caught in the back of a van down on Harry Hines. And anybody that's listening will see this from Dallas, will know about Harry Hines. That's where all the prostitutes, all the drugs are. He said, I was down on Harry Hines. I was back in the, a van with two prostitutes smoking crack. And the police came along, and I now, you know, have legal issues because of it. Well, he, he had other legal issues. It wasn't just that. But that was the one that I think put him into the felony class. And um, he, um, his wife was still working. He lost his job. He spent a lot of their money. He was, his, his marriage was in big trouble. Um, so I worked with him for a long time, long time. And I remember one day he said, I've had enough of this. He said, um, you want, I want his wife to come in. I said, I, I want your wife to come in. This is family therapy. You're not going to get well without having her be supportive in some way for you. I've had enough. This is my deal. He said, it's not my wife's deal. It's my deal. So he walks out the door, and I said, I'll see you again. And he said, not on your life. Okay. And that's literally what happened. So he leaves. No kidding. Here he comes again. About a few months later, um, lost a lot of weight, looked like he had been run over by something. He really looked homeless. Got back into the stuff, got into more legal problems. Okay. They worked, he worked his way out of the legal problems. But finally, I worked with him longer than I should have, okay? I should have not worked with him that long, and I say that because there was something special about him that, that I knew this guy, if he could ever get it, if he could just ever get it, it would be great. So, and I told him about Jesus, I did. 
And um, he did finally come to know the Lord. It took a while, but he did. So he comes to me one day and he says, I want to do what you're doing. And I'd heard that many times. And I said, well, okay. I said, here's what you have to do. You have to do a practicum, two years intern. You have to uh, get, go ahead and get more education, get some continuing education as well. And I said, then you can come to me and work for me for two years for free. He said, for free. And I said, for free, if you really want to do it. And he, he was financially okay. So he, he said, okay. And I thought this guy would quit halfway through. He didn't. I said, if you'll work for me, I'll hire you. If you'll do the two years. He did. I hired him. Okay. So he was one of my best therapists because he had been down that road. He, but he was also, he got the license, the education, everything he needed. And so, um, then I was leaving that hospital to go do something else. And he, I said uh, to the CEO of the hospital, I said, this guy's ready for prime time. He's ready to take this whole shebang. So they made him director. So he ended up working 18 years as director of the program I had started. And as a Christian and drug free. That's God. That's not me, that's God. And I'm glad I listened to the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit was saying, this guy's worth it. He's worth it. All right. So I got called away from Dallas to New Mexico. And I went to work there. They had, I did a, it was a two-year contract position to open up uh, programs for domestic violence and substance abuse for women who were on TANF the uh, temporary assistance for needy families. They were on welfare. And the goal was to get them so they get off welfare. So the goal to get off welfare was they had to go to college, get a job, definitely be drug free. And um, I, I don't know about the domestic violence thing. That, that was a different animal. But what we did, we, um, um, we opened up a program at the John Heisen, and I mention this because it's still around, John Heisen Center in the heart of cartel country. Um, now you know why I don't mention any names. And it was not well received. It was literally where all these people, all the people in Española and Chimayo, uh, one of the highest um, heroin overdoses in the country per capita at that time. I think we, a lot of other places, I think Kentucky and West Virginia has beaten out New Mexico by now. So we opened it up and we had a procession from Sanctuario de, Ch de Chimayo all the way down, about two miles procession full of hundreds of people and the Archbishop of the Catholic Church. New Mexico is predominantly Catholic. He was leading the procession and I was right beside him. And we went to open it up to, to um, bless the center, pray for it. And we had our first batch of women in there, mainly women. And um, um, I get a call from, I worked also with DEA there and um, sat on um, committees that took children out of methamphetamine environments and um, other stuff. And uh, I got a phone call one day and the phone call said from a friend, it was not a foe, it was a friend. And he said, next time you go up to Chimayo, don't take the state car and wear a brown wig. Don't, don't take, don't, identify yourself in any way. So I said, oh, I said, am I in trouble? He said, I, if, if there's been death threats. And he said, don't stay long. Okay. Um, the Lord didn't call me into that to be afraid. Okay. I'm either stupid or it's, it's Jesus and I believe it's Jesus. I kept going. I kept meeting with those women. I kept telling them about Jesus. So I went to a meeting, and in the meeting, uh, it was a big, long table, and it was a meeting with both the state and the locals 
of Hispaniola and, De, uh, and Chimayo. And I was at one end of the table and this young police commissioner was at the other. And he pounded the table with his fist and said, you, there's a drug treatment facility in my territory and I didn't know anything about it. Well, you know, if I was a police commissioner, I'd be real happy about that, wouldn't you? I'd be delighted, okay? No, he was angry. And so then it got more and more dangerous for me to be up there. Um, and it was, uh, I could have stayed. It was a two-year contract. I did what I went there for. I did what I promised I would do. And so the rest is history. The programs are still around. They're still treating folks. I think, uh, I don't know if there's a dent, a dent in the, the opioid, um, the heroin addiction for New Mexico. Again, I think West Virginia and Kentucky took the lead on that. So um, I didn't have any treatment relationship with any of those folks just opening up those centers, but would interact with them only when they were in treatment. Hi, how are you? Pray for them, that sort of thing. So I talked to you about the railroad, about the trauma there. Uh, I gave you a, an example of what that looks like. Um, then I got called to go to Kentucky, my home state. And this was right bef this was two and a half years before COVID. And I thought, I'm not doing anything, <laughs> why not? So I did, I went, and we, um, we opened up a bunch of um, programs uh, for both the opioid, uh, the opioid problem and also for um, sex trafficking, human sex trafficking for those that were 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, also anyone in their early 20s. It, they're still going. Uh, that, that gal's gonna come visit the church too. She um, has, I talked to her the other day, and she has 16 women in this huge mansion they bought out in the country in, in Kentucky. But one of the cases, um, I got a call, uh, my admissions people got a call and said, well, so-and-so is down at the Kentucky Dam. She wants us to come and get her. And I said, well, what's going on? And I said, well, who knows? So I said, can you get her back? And they said, no, and the other gal said, well, it looks like she has run off to the dollar store and she has no clothes on. She had escaped. She was being trafficked. And I said, you're going after her. You're gonna go down there and you're gonna go get her. Well, it's pretty far. I said, I don't care if it's across the country, you're gonna go get her. And they did, they went and got her. She was at the dollar store where she had escaped. And they brought her up to the facility uh, just a darling young gal, uh, probably had two kids before she was 16, all farmed out to foster care, don't even know where they are. And so um, I, we got her cleaned up, got her detoxed, uh, which does take a while to get somebody back to some sort of normal. And <clears throat> so, she, um, her story was just horrendous. I'm not gonna tell you the full story. It'll, you'll go home tonight and it'll depress you. But we, we did get her fixed up. And then Victory House is in Paducah. That's the, that was the closest for us at the time for, it's much like Well House here, okay? So it was the place that was the closest. So I got one of the therapists to go with me. So she and I took this gal down to Victory House, and we, we took her in the SUV. We pulled up, they were expecting her. We'd already made all the arrangements. We went in, and she could have stayed as long as she wanted, usually a couple of years, something like that. So um, they helped retrain them, get them jobs, um, that sort of thing. And I remember going into um, the room that she was, staying in, the, the other therapist and I, and, 
And the, she turned to me, they gave her a gift that was on the dresser. And she turned to me and she said, they really like me. <laughs> and I thought, how sad. This, it just broke my heart. And she stayed. She became a hairdresser, okay? I don't know where, someplace in the country. I have no idea. This is God. This is God. This is exactly what he does. Um, much more, but, you know, it. I've given you the meat of it. That, so you see what I want you to look at, and I'm going to read you the last part, which will speak how this all has come full circle for me. Okay? So when I taught you about depression, anxiety, and trauma, and I'm going to teach addictions, the pastor's going to teach the sexual addiction piece, and then I think there's going to be one, a small group on eating disorders um, toward the spring. But as I tell you this, I've been through all this. Okay, except for the sexual piece. That was, I, God spared me with all of that. Um, I had a um, healthy two marriages, you know, from sexually. No abuse. And I, I thank God for that. But I was able, and I am still able to love those people, work with them, know the hurt and the pain. And you do. You look into those eyeballs and you see nothing but just horrendous pain, pain and agony, okay? And why couldn't you? That's Jesus loves them. I, I was, Jesus was loving them through me. I don't have that ability. I don't. If you had told me back in the day when all this started that I was going to be doing what I'm doing today, I would say, no, you're not, it's not me. I'm not going to be doing that, and I'm going to be doing thus and thus and thus, but this and that and that, whatever, but not that. So I'm going to read you this last part, and then we're going to close. It's coming full circle. As I come to the end of my career, I try to make peace with where I've been and where I am today. I'm walking down the dirt road in Tucson with Big Mac. That's one of the horses. This horse, my friend Jamie Vink. And I use Jamie, and it's okay, because Jamie's CEO of a big treatment facility. <clears throat> Jamie uses an equine therapy. Jamie is the chief executive officer of Sierra Tucson and a close friend of mine. Big Mac follows me as I hold the reins. I see Jamie waiting in the distance on the property where she boards Big Mac. This colorful part of the desert is home to big acacia trees, several hundred-year-old swaros with their wide open arms, and the yellow bloom of the Palo Verde. In the distance is the backdrop of the Catalina Mountains. I think back to the day I rode Kentucky Pride, the day my life took a course I would not have chosen, but that turned out to be a higher calling. I have dearly loved every moment of the calling. I find that now, as I'm face to face with Big Mac, I'm taking shorter breaths and I'm a little shaky inside. First time I've been around a horse since the accident, by the way. This is equine therapy that Jamie had suggested I do. The moment takes me back to the accident that landed me in the hospital with eight hours of surgery to repair my broken back. My mind has blocked out those memories, only knowing that the accident happened, but not the details. A pattern shared by many who have experienced trauma. Jamie instructs me, as I have major difficulty concentrating, a sign of trauma, I start with my deep breathing exercises, using mindfulness to focus on Big Mac while listening intently to Jamie. My body starts to relax. I look around and take in God's wonderful bounty that surround me. This is all part of using mindfulness and prayer to take away anxiety. Jamie has put Big Mac in the center of a circle. I approach him as, I, as, I, as he waits for us. The animal is truly beautiful with his chestnut coat and massive body. Here I am in the last chapter of life, trying to make sense of where I've been and how I faced the journey. I am now in communion with this wonderful animal while staring Big Mac in the eyes. 
I start to well up with tears. My reflection is mirrored in his eyes as I see years past, a whirlwind of emotional, physical, mental pain. The flashbacks are incredible as I see loved ones who have come and gone, buried trauma resurfaces. As my brain starts to remember some of the details of that tragic day, <clears throat> I see the little girl who wanted to do the right thing, only to have alcohol and drugs take her tempor temporarily off a different path with an agenda to destroy her. These are the difficulties I have conquered and others I have just accepted. Raging anger is now quieted. Mostly I see a journey that was a lifelong battle with alcohol and drugs, a battle that I fought and won. A peace comes over my soul. I know that I'm at the end of this journey. It all makes sense to me now as I look back, knowing that giving back for 40 years has bought me sobriety. This was I wrote this in four, 40 years. And that giving back was the calling of God, whose thoughts and ways were higher than mine. I've lived a life that has taken tragedy and turned it into giving back. Getting sober and into recovery has been an ongoing process for me. The weeks that I spent in patient treatment were only a fraction of the beginning of a new transformed life. Jesus has been the wind that has kept me craving a sober life. The steps that I have used daily for all my so sober years have helped me put into practice a way of life that once seemed foreign. I got right into church in Alcoholics Anonymous. It was difficult for me to read because it had been years since I had picked up a book or an article of any kind. Alcohol and drugs won't allow you to read or comprehend. So trying to wade through the scriptures and the 12 steps was difficult. I knew that somewhere in the big book, actually in both big books, was a key to sober living and at least that's what I heard in church in AA. AA was wonderful, but I needed something more to help me stay sober and drug free. So I started organizing my thoughts into positive negative images, and I'm gonna share that with you when I go into the addiction piece. Lastly, I'm a Christian. I'm ex I've accepted Jesus into my life long before the addiction got out of control. What I wanted to do with my life, I wouldn't have said I wanted to work with the mentally ill and the chemically dependent, but God had a different purpose for my life. The Lord has given me the desire and love for those who have been bound by addiction and mental illness. And I close with this scripture. And we know that in all things, not just some, all things work for the good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Thank you for listening. We're done. We're out a little early, but it's okay. It's okay. Glad, okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm not going to leave it open to questions because I don't use names. And you, now you know why I don't use the names, okay? All right. Good night.